Hello and welcome. My name is Olli Tietäväinen. And I'm Pontus Boström. And we are here to talk about some software engineering lessons from maintenance. And uh, uh, who are we to talk about uh, software engineering lessons? Uh, well, I have been at, at Vardin for a couple of years and I've mostly worked at, at maintenance and uh, maintenance of applications that uh, have been developed at, at Vardin. I've been, working, I've been working with Vardin for a couple of years as well. Um, I've been working with maintenance, but also new project development. And uh, before joining Vardin, I've been working with maintenance on and off for maybe seven to eight years. So I have quite a lot of experience with maintenance projects. Okay, so what's the topic of this presentation? So we will talk about uh, maintenance of end user applications, uh, applications where the maintainers are often not the same as the original developers. And uh, this is not a general presentation about maintainability. Uh, we will just uh, talk about some lessons learned the hard way in uh, various projects that we have, have been working on. And even though we have a sort of background in Vardin applications, I think that most of these lessons are applicable to pretty much any, anybody who's working in maintenance. So what, what is maintenance work? Typically it's adding small new features and fixing bugs. Usually this happens so that it's not an ongoing process. So it happens only occasionally. Maybe it can happen once a month once a week, a couple of times a year. But it could be that there's a long time before anything changes. It could be that it, it is even months before uh, anything has happened. Usually we have a lot of different people working on the same application. So when you, the maintainer, come in, it could be that there have been quite a lot of changes that you are not aware of. Okay, so something about the contents of this presentation. We will talk about uh, documentation, uh, the workflow, the data model of the application, something about logging and uh, testing, and finish up with some words about code quality. So, uh, documentation. So one of these essential things uh, that you need is maintenance manual. This is a step-by-step -step guide to set up the system and to build it. Uh, this is very important because, as we said, there is uh, often uh, long pauses between development. There are new people coming and going, so they need to be uh, quick at setting up the project, uh, people forget, and so on. So it's important that this uh, setup and uh, build is, is really well documented. Most uh, applications have a standard architecture, so you might not need a very uh, comprehensive documentation with all architecture descriptions, detailed description of how everything works. Nobody has time to read a book when all you need to do is change the color of a button or something, do a simple fix and so on. So you don't want to figure the, these things out by yourself, you want to follow a step-by-step -step guide. And especially if you have a huge documentation about your software architecture, it becomes costly to keep it up if you want to change something. If you have a mismatch between your implementation and the documentation, that's not going to help anyone. That's going to make things more difficult. So let's talk about workflow. Usually you should try to follow a standard workflow. What it means is not very well defined, but it's one of those things that when you see it, you know it. So if you ask any developer, how do you start a new project? They will give you some steps that, okay, you do this, you do this, and you do this. And then you can run it by doing this, or you can make a build by doing, doing something else. So try to sort of follow these standard steps as much as possible. It's not always optimal. You might want to make some changes that make your specific use case work, but then you must at least try to make it so that nobody has to sort of learn these steps by trial and error. So if it's possible, try to automate these sort of non-standard steps. For example, just use a simple shell script that runs a couple of commands in together instead of needing or requiring the developer to do those same things every time over and over again. When it has been a couple of months, it might take time to remember what are those magic steps to work. If you can, try to automate those steps. And even better, if you can, try to fail. Try to fail fast. Try to not produce some uninteresting results that don't work. So if you, for example, have a standard condition that you must remember to do 
something you must connect to VPN before you can build this software. Uh, try to fail with an error message that hey, maybe you haven't connected to VPN instead of throwing some connection error message that doesn't really help anyone. Okay, so some words about the data model. So one common problem in production is that performance is not good, that the software is slow. Uh, this often has to do something with fetching data from the database. So often uh, in the Java world, tools like JPA are used, uh, implementations such as, as Eclipse Link or Hibernate. Typically, some, uh, some problems can arise when, when accessing data from the database. Uh, Hibernate and Eclipse Link makes it very easy to do, uh, but there are performance problems. Typically, one can end up in situations where you fetch basically all the data for one user, even if you only need a, a fraction of the data for, to show in a particular view or something like that. So you need really to be very careful about fetching data from the database and only fetch the data that you need. In several projects that this has required a huge refactoring of the code to actually cut down on the data that is, is fetched or when showing data to the user. And uh, this is often a costly refactoring to do and uh, it's often very difficult to do afterwards. So this is something that should really be done, done with care. Then a uh, few words about logging. Logging is sort of the main tool of a maintenance person trying to solve some issues that are in production. There are different types of logging that can help. We have troubleshooting logging, audit logging, reporting. Uh, these all have slightly different connotations, but mainly this is something you need to do in order to get information out of production systems. Most of the cases you cannot just go to production and test something uh, that fails or it's not either feasible or it's not even possible to do that. You might not have the correct access rights and so on. It's always quite difficult to know how much logging is enough. So you want to have enough information, but then you don't want to log everything because if your application has anything more than a, a very simple basic set of functions and a few users, then you will be getting a lot of logs if you log everything. So try to keep the logs relevant. And here are a few tips on what kinds of information you might want to log. When you are trying to debug something, you probably at least need to know the stack traces when an unexpected exception happens. You might know that in this case you don't need them since it's known exception, but still you might want to know how did you get there. You will probably also want to have some way of tracing the events that happened for a specific user or a specific session so that you know the chain of events that happened instead of just this program module failed at a certain time. If possible, try to provide a pointer to the data that made the system fail. There might be some reasons that you cannot do this or you don't want to do this. There might be a lot of data that you don't want to log every time. Or there might be some restrictions like uh, confidentiality that you don't want to log everything just because you are, for example, storing some sensitive information that shouldn't be on the logs. But if that's not the case, try to log at least the sort of main data object that's causing some problems with you. If you are calling external services like with SOAP or REST, try to log at least the input and output to the services. Since if that service is not under your control, you should probably be able to provide the service maintainer some information that, okay, we have been calling your service with these parameters and we are getting this response, which is not what we expected. So can you look at your logs and find out if you can do something about it? We are, as far as we know, doing what is the right thing. And then they might say that, okay, you are using the wrong parameters to our service to, or, uh, okay, we have a bug here, so we will fix it. And of course, that's always best for you. And a few words about performance logging. This is something that uh, you might want to do if you have a case that you have a slowdown in production. It depends on every application on what actually needs to be logged. But uh, usually you don't get the same information in a development environment than in production, just because the data is probably not the same. If you are using something like Spring, you can use AOP or maybe some configuration to inject some performance logging statements. If you have a known sort of a chain of events that causes slowdown, like a specific query or something like that, 
You can turn on performance logging for a short while, since this is also quite expensive performance-wise, and then disable it after you are done, and then you can take the logs and see that what was actually happening there, why is this so slow, and then you can maybe try to re-implement it so that it's not actually breaking so much or being so slow. So to the next topic, which is testing. So uh, one thing to remember when writing tests is that tests need to be maintained too. Badly written tests can really cost a lot of time and uh, then money to maintain. So what are typical causes of, of test failures? And uh, by test failures, I mean here that failures that are not uh, actual bugs in the, in the system. So one common thing is incomplete test data, that uh, the test for a specific test data and when the system changed, uh, the sufficient test data is no longer available and the test fails because of missing data. Another thing is uh, using mocking. Mocking is typically used to mock out uh, sort of database access, uh, network access and, and so on, so tests can be run locally. But this also makes it the tests very sensitive to, to changing in the system because uh, if some uh, calls to a background uh, database or some calls to network services change, uh, the mocking needs to be changed also, and this can cause a lot of, of this failure. So I would go so far even to say that mocking is evil, even though it can be useful in, in some cases. Another thing that is uh, sort of one favorite thing to make tests fail at random uh, points is have time-dependent tests, so you sort of use the current time as test data, for example. Uh, this can make tests fail sort of uh, pretty randomly. For example, they only work at, uh, at office hours or they uh, don't work at leap years or they don't work when the next weekend there is a daylight saving time change and so on. So this can be really frustrating bugs to find in the tests. So this is something that, that really should be avoided. So testing, some, some lessons learned about testing. This is something that uh, it can be found in many textbooks also, that you should really avoid creating new tests by copy-pasting and changing details. Because combined with these uh, three points on the previous slide, they really make uh, maintenance of, of tests slow and, and difficult and time-consuming. Try to use really good test data. Uh, if you have a dump of the database, production database, it's a good thing to have once you have that. Then you have real data to test with, much more reliable and comprehensive than, than uh, just creating data by hand. Really use uh, mocking as, as with care only when absolutely needed. Don't ever use anything like new date in, in tests. And one more thing, consider that do you really need 100% test coverage? Because I think in most cases you don't need that much coverage. You want something like 70-80% maybe, uh, if you are really ambitious. Of course, that's always much better than zero. But uh, if you have 100% test coverage, you are bound to also be making maintenance more difficult, just because changing anything also means that you need to change tests for even trivial things. Finally, a few words about code quality. Why do we care about code quality? Well, in maintenance, it's usually too late to care about code quality. If the code is bad, it means that there's a lot of technical depth, and uh, that means that there are a lot of things that need to be fixed. But usually the, in the maintenance phase, there is no more time or money to fix things like quality. And you should have this kind of consistent style and quality enforced. You can use lots of tools for this. There's, for example, SonarCube, FindBugs. There are lots of different built-in IDE tools. Uh, that will give you a hint that if you are trying to do something that's sort of a bad code smell, uh, if there's like an uninitialized variable or if there's an uncaught exception or whatever, try to use the tools in your advantage. Especially these IDE plugins are very handy. You even use this automatic code completion to add this kind of missing uh, functionality. But uh, some of those might be sort of even slower running that will only give you a report of what things you should fix. You should use these. You should fix those things because the maintenance people, people will thank you if you have a good quality code base. Try to include these code quality analysis tools from the start. 
since it will take you a long time to fix all the issues afterwards and nobody really cares at least from the management point of view that do we pass those code quality metrics they care that they have a working product but you as a developer you should care that you have good quality code base that will not give you headaches in the long run yeah so there are several things that can improve maintainability first of all uh, easy and uh, documented setup of the environment and this is uh, something that is really important it should be easy to get the system set up and, and built and uh, the steps should be documented uh, carefully well thought out data model well thought out logging and uh, tests written with maintainability in mind so with these things you will have a much easier time maintaining your software and uh, uh, thinking about these things from the, the start will really help you out in, in the long run. Yeah. And try to remember that these things uh, need to be taken care of upfront. Uh, probably you won't have time to add good logging or uh, fix the data model while you are in the maintenance phase. So try to set them up in the beginning. And uh, try to do them right in the first try. It's not always easy, but it is probably worth the time you need to do that. At least some thought should be spent on this, these issues so that they should not be just uh, something that uh, thrown together, but some, some time should be spent on thinking about these, these things. Yeah. Thank you very much for watching. See you later. Okay, thank you.